Jesus. Hello. Um, you just caught me reading the um, IET code of practice for the in-service inspection and testing of electrical equipment. So let's do a video on PAT testing. The in-service inspection and testing of electrical equipment is the mouthful the IET boffins call it. PAT testing is what we, the great and washed, know and love it as. Yes, PAT testing or portable appliance testing testing. It's one of those strings that you may have added to your electrical bow or perhaps you avoid it completely. Either way, if working in this industry, the chances are that you'll see it performed improperly out in the wild. So let's have a closer look at the highs and lows, the ups and downs, and yes, to hell with it, even the ins and outs of the damn thing. Well, at least as far as I'm prepared to go in what is effectively an introductory overview on the subject. Pat testing courses vary between one to three days, the sitting guilds 2377 being a two-day course covering the management requirements and the inspection and testing. There's also 150 page code of practice. So despite a lot of dry waffle here today, there's just no way I'm covering everything in this video. Buy the book and do the classroom time if this is something you're serious about. Speaking of the code of practice, let me introduce you to it. This being a third edition published in 2007. But the IET brought out a fourth edition in 2012, which I must admit I had been ignorant of until I started making this video last September. Yes, it's taken a bit of time to get around to finally editing and pooing out this thing, and you know what? It may prove to be terrible timing anyway, as the fifth edition is due out any time now with some major changes I hear, so uh, bear in mind that some of what I say at the time of recording may quickly prove to be out of date, although I presume the basics remain kind of the same. You know, I think it was in 2012 that I sat the City and Guild's 2377 course, so they must have changed the 4th edition right around the time I was rebelliously flicking bogeys at the teacher with the use of my ruler from the back of the classroom. According to Amazon, the 4th edition has also been through a major rewrite, so if I've been working with reference to the 3rd edition, does that mean I've been doing pat testing wrong all these years? Well, it turns out largely not. Despite spending £43 on this new book, yes folks, that's £43, or about 24 cans of tenant super in beer token terms, there's not really a lot new to report, at least not with the testing procedure itself. 43 quid, Jesus. I can get drunk and or laid on that. Actually, both if I pop to my local Audi and park my transit in the service road behind it. Or so I hear, it'll be ages before the YouTube ads pay this one off. So I hope you appreciate my financial sacrifices. Because of this, I can't afford my low-cost hookers this week. But enough whinging. Let's get down and dirty with it. And firstly, I shall address the misnomer of portable appliance testing. That is, it doesn't just apply to portable appliances. We're all perhaps familiar with fixed wiring testing, the good old periodic inspection, or as the boffins like to address it, the electrical installation condition reporting procedure. Well, that involves inspection and testing of the fixed wiring from the distribution board to the point of utilisation, such as a socket outlet and fuse unit. The appliance hanging off that point is largely outside the remit of that process, be it something handheld such as a hairdryer, heavy white goods like fridge freezers and washing machines, or something screwed to the wall such as a hand dryer or insect zapper. Obviously, if you're conducting an EICR and you spot an appliance that's plugged in that is clearly electrically faulty or dangerous, then you're likely to do something about it, unless you're some kind of ignoramus. But the EICR process doesn't include inspection and testing of appliances themselves, so these are the things the PAT testing procedure is concerned with. When we talk about something being portable, we don't mean that it is handheld or that it can even be picked up and carried. We're actually referring to equipment that is removable, for want of a better term, so I guess it should really be removable appliance testing or RAT? Maybe that acronym isn't quite so saleable. Anyway, the point is that appliances are not necessarily portable, as in they have a handle and can easily be transported. They may well be handheld, or they could be movable, such as a lawnmower that's on wheels, or they may be fixed, like an insect zapper on the wall, or stationary, like a washing machine, or even built in, like an integral fridge freezer in a fitted kitchen. If it's on a plug top, then it falls under pat as a general rule of thumb. Then there are some greyer areas. A hand dryer hangs off a fused connection unit rather than a plug top because the former is more practical around the drunken bums in your average pub toilet. OK, so both the appliance and its connection aren't removable without tools, but it's still consumer equipment that is fused down, and that connection plate can be thought of as a fixed wiring plug top in effect. 
But what about other items of equipment such as electric showers, ovens and hobs? These are on dedicated circuits and tend to fall outside of both the EICR and PAT processes, as the former usually sees testing up to the isolator or connection point, while the latter often omits such appliances entirely. Rather than falling into the gap between condition reporting and PAT testing, fixed appliances should come under the PAT remit, even if they don't connect via a plug top or fused connection plate. Those performing an EICR usually wouldn't bother testing the appliances themselves. But if we want a picture of the safety of the electrical equipment which end users are in direct contact with, then that's the point of the PAT process. That said, you still have to exercise judgement before undertaking any testing. If pulling out a washing machine is likely to damage a linoleum floor, or if removal of a hob requires disassembly of fitted kitchen furniture, then you may choose to limit your testing by having terms and conditions stating that equipment must be practical to access. There are physical limitations out on site that prevent us always doing everything by the book. It's just not always reasonable to start disassembling someone's fitted kitchen for the sake of something like a pap test. Now let's move on to legality. Do you legally need to have anything at all pat tested? Well, no, not as such. The code of practice for in-service inspection and testing is a code of practice and not law. It's the same as BS 7671, the wiring regulations. It's best practice and compliance is likely to keep you out of trouble. But the FBI, KGB, MI5, HSE, or in this neck of the woods, even the much feared Warwickshire police aren't going to kick down your back doors at 6am and shove a spiked truncheon up your poo hole should you not comply. At least not until things all go tits up. And that is where pat testing comes into play. It in itself isn't a legal requirement, but this motherfucker sure is. The Electricity at Work Regulations 1989. Where were you in 1989? I suspect many of you watching this were just one Kleenex away from being flushed down the toilet or wiped disrespectfully across the bedroom curtains. Personally, I was in my final year of cocking up my GCSEs at a brutal Coventry secondary school, getting my fucking head flushed down the toilet on a regular basis by the same thick twats who now wash my van for a living although they still punch me in the balls and take my dinner money while doing it. The bastards! But I'm going off track here. The point was that EAWR is most righteously statutory, and that shit means comply or die. Or don't comply and someone else may die, in which case you're fucking nicked, mate. If you're the bugger responsible for the electrical safety of any building, domestic or commercial, the two words you're looking for to keep your arse safely out of the prison showers and away from Big Bubba's pump-action yoghurt cannon are due diligence. If Joe Schmo, your tenant employee or any other building visitor such as a, well, a visitor or a customer fries from electrocution or dies as a direct result of an electrical fire, then the long arm of the law will be gripping you firmly by the short and curlies, unless you're female, in which case they'll be grabbing you President Trump style. Either way, it won't be nearly as much fun as it sounds, and it'll sting for a long time when you have a wee afterwards. So it's up to you to prove that the electrical installation was safe if you're responsible for it. And yes, I acknowledge the irony here of the law requiring you to prove your innocence of neglect. After all, in the eyes of the law, you're innocent until proven guilty. No? Fuck no. Not when it comes to the safety and maintenance of your electrical installation. You're proper guilty, mate, that is, unless you can prove you had the right people in over the years to ensure it's all shipshape and Bristol fashion. If you're a landlord or a facilities manager, then even where you hired someone else to undertake your electrical inspection and testing on fixed wiring or portable appliances, if the people you employ are low-cost chances, then the book still stops with you. It's down to you to ensure that those tasked with those responsibilities are suitably trained and insured to undertake that kind of work. If you hire in Jack Twat Electrical Fucktardry Limited for your pack testing because he only charges 50 pence per item, carries no professional indemnity insurance, and doesn't provide any bona fides for being up to the task, then what you'll end up with is a simple sticker slapper who goes about whacking pass labels onto everything in sight because he doesn't really know what he's doing, which makes a mockery of the whole goddamn process and leaves you holding the proverbial smoking gun. And this is the reason I don't try to compete on price for condition reporting or pat testing. There will always be some asshole who will do it cheaper because they don't have the pesky overheads like insurance, equipment calibration or training and they don't intend to do the job properly, just quickly. We'll have a look later at the kind of cock-ups you get when you get the job done cheaply rather than competently. This is my Martindale Handy Pat 600, and as far as pat testers go, this is pretty basic, but it's perfectly fine for the kind of environments I test in domestic rentals, small offices, shops, and such like. It takes rechargeable AA batteries, supports 250 or 500 volt insulation resistance testing, has a backlit display, and is super portable. 
It also has a memory for up to 200 results, although personally I enter the results onto my laptop as I go along, and we'll have a look at how they're recorded later. Some models support additional testing features that we'll look at, and some allow the connection of a printer for uh, pass-fail labels to be produced electronically. Not this one though, because I got cheap when I bought it. Anyway, you can get simpler pat testers than this. I wouldn't recommend them though. They may lack the 250 volt test option and I've seen some that just show a straight pass or fail rather than the discrete test values. But pat testing isn't that black and white. And as an operator, you need to be able to interpret the results you're seeing to avoid false outcomes, as we shall see. I suppose the best way to talk about the pat testing procedure is to show a test in action. So let's test this class one toaster. Class one means the item has basic insulation and earth metal parts. So the brass pin uh, on the plug top connects to a green yellow wire which runs through the flex and into the appliance itself where it terminates onto the metal casing. Of course the job of that earth wire is to present a low impedance path so should the appliance develop a fault which would otherwise see the metal casing go live the fault current travels down the earth wire rather than merrily through your body when you come to cook your crumpets. We're assuming the socket outlet has a working earth and our fixed wiring test should have confirmed that. So we'll be testing how good the earth path is on just the appliance itself. We first need to take the visual inspection. Is there any sign of damage to the appliance, the cord or the plug? Uh, no cracks, breaks, missing panels, etc. It all looks good to me. If there are any defects, any obvious faults, anything that you can see that is visually wrong with the thing, then there's no point in proceeding with the actual testing. Instead, the appliance should be removed from service and disposed of or repaired. It should also be recorded as a failure and labelled with a do not use sticker. Ideally, you'd remove the fuse or the plug to prevent someone from bringing it back into service without some conscious determination and a level of reckless stupidity. This appliance looks fine though, there's no alarm bells ringing here. I'm also going to open up the plug top to check that the wires are correctly located and secured and that the right fuse is fitted. Uh, for this appliance rated at 835 watts, this 5 amp fuse is appropriate. If it were say a desk lamp, then a 3 amp fuse would be right for the job, while a 1500 watt heater would need a 13 amp fuse. In a lot of offices you see 5 amp or 10 amp fuses fitted in things like IEC power leads, used for IT equipment and such, but most appliance manufacturers generally use either a 3 amp or 13 amp fuse. This plug top looks fine, uh, the cord grips in place. Polarity is correct, uh, everything's terminated tightly, no loose strands, and fuse is appropriate and looks genuine. Also there's no sign of overheating, no cracks or breaks, and the line and neutral pins are sleeved uh, as per requirements that came into British Standard 1363, the standard for these plugs, way back in 1984. Anyway, the visual inspection is relatively quick even with opening the plug top, but again, hire the cheap sticker slappers and they probably won't take the time to even peer in here. Let's plug it into the tester. Uh, get rid of some of this. I'll put the tester. Here we go. As I touched on earlier, there are two things I want to know about this appliance from the tester. Uh, is the impedance of the earth path nice and low, and is the resistance of the insulation separating the live parts nice and high? If we find the earth path is no good, then this is a shock risk should it go faulty. If the insulation has broken down or been compromised, then it's a shock or fire risk, and it may also cause tripping back at the distribution board, which would be a nuisance at best, perhaps even damaging in a business environment if it takes out an important circuit where some bean counter in accounts hasn't saved their changes in Excel. The Martindale comes with a uh, crocodile clip lead, which you often have a bit of a job clipping to most appliances, so I carry this old screwdriver around with me, which I can clip onto and poke into places such as case screw heads to get some decent contact. Shouldn't be any problem with this thing though, there's uh, plenty of metal work I ought to be able to clip onto here. So let's clip onto the casing. And what I'm going to do is an earth continuity soft test or a low current test. It's not just a straight resistance test between the earth pin of the plug top and the earth case of the appliance like you could do with a cheap multimeter. The PAT instrument puts out a few DC volts at 200 milliamps which should effectively be shorted out by a low impedance path. We may even see a tiny spark or hear the pop of one at the point where the probe or uh, clip is in contact with the earth metal work. Some testers perform this test bidirectionally, that is the current is sent down the plug top, then it's sent down the test lead and the highest reading is returned. I don't know if my particular tester does that. But anyway, I'm connected by plug and by probe and I'm now going to go and tell it to do an earth test. So, uh, there we go. 
I'm going to flex the cable uh, while it's doing that to try and expose any weakness that might be in there. Okay, super, there's our number. Can we see that? 0.05 and a pass. What we want to see on an appliance like this with a short lead is a value below 0.10 ohm. If this equipment had a detachable cord, then the value we'd be after would be under 0.1 ohm for the appliance itself, plus the resistance of the supply cord. Now in this case, I can't detach the cord, and other than opening the plug top, this process isn't supposed to be invasive. So I'm not going to get the screwdrivers out and start taking this thing apart. As the cord is quite short and an integral part of this appliance, then I want to see a reading below 0.1 ohm for the whole shebang, and there it is. Incidentally, it may be the case that I have to test multiple points on any given appliance to ensure consistent results. I said that this was a soft test or a low current test, and that's because there is an alternative test for good earth continuity called the hard test. No, not that kind of hard, you pervert. This alternative test, a hard test or a high current test, uses a current uh, not less than 1.5 times the fuse rating up to a maximum value of 26 amps. For this toaster with a 5 amp fuse, a current of not less than 7.5 amps would therefore be required, and it would need to be applied for between 5 and 20 seconds. The advantage of the hard test is that it can overcome poor connection points that the soft test is too puny to penetrate. The disadvantage is that you may end up frying the appliance under test, particularly if it's sensitive IT equipment. My Martindale doesn't support hard testing, and most PAT tests will be undertaken employing the soft test method. Certainly, any battery operated PAT tester will be limited to soft testing only. If you want to squirt up to 26 amps into something, then you're going to be plugging the tester itself into the wall to get anywhere near that kind of welly. So knowing that the earth path on this toaster is okay, the next thing I want to check is the resistance of the insulating materials between live parts. What I mean by that is that the line and neutral wires providing power and carrying current to this thing ought to be insulated from the metallic parts I'm likely to be in direct contact with when I burn my bagels. I've talked about insulation resistance in three previous videos, so let's not delve too much into it here. But what the tester will do now is squirt 500 volts up both line and neutral simultaneously and detect whether anything is leaking back to earth by the probe here. Because the test voltage is being applied to both line and neutral at the same time, the potential difference across them is zero, so no equipment should be damaged by this procedure. It's true that if there's a blown fuse on the line conductor, a single pole switch in the off position, or a break in the flex on either line or neutral, then that test voltage will only get applied to one conductor. But you know, manufacturers know that appliances will be subject to testing, and frankly, if any item of equipment can't withstand a basic pat test process, then it probably shouldn't be out in the wild for you to use. If you're buying Chineseium electrical garbage from iffy internet auction sites, then all bets are off when it comes to compliance and safety. That said, the 500 volt test is considered by the code of practice as another hard test. If you're worried that the 500 volt test may cause damage, or if the item of equipment that you're testing is surge protected, then you can undertake this test at 250 volts, which ought not to damage anything. Obviously, when squirting 500 volts or whatever into the appliance, it's best not to be in direct contact with it. The tester puts out a high voltage at a low current, but you might still get an uncomfortable twang out of it. Let's see what we get from this toaster, shall we? And I'm hoping the insulation is in good condition. This test instrument having a full scale deflection of 200 mega ohms. And yes, I did say mega ohms, not mega ohms, as dropping the A is just lazy and I order you all to immediately stop pronouncing it that way. Mega ohm is like thin crust pizza, it's just not cricket when compared to the delights of deep pan, and if that analogy doesn't prove I'm right, then I just don't know what will. Anyway, let's kick off this uh, insulation test. And sure enough, we're off scale high here. So we got there over 200 mega ohms and a pass. So uh, despite this toaster having a few years on the odometer, the insulation in this thing hasn't been damaged, nor has it broken down. The minimum value of that would have been acceptable here is one mega ohm, same as on a 240 volt circuit in BS7671. But certain heating or cooking appliances could be as low as 0.3 mega ohm without being a failure, just because ceramic heating elements can have a naturally low IR when cold. Let's plumb our data into the result sheet. The code of practice has a model form for results, but it's utter overkill in my opinion. I have my own form created in Excel, which is simpler and records less data. Should I be recording less than the model form expects? Maybe not, but the core data is there and it ought to suffice for the purposes of demonstrating the test was carried out effectively. Anyway, that's my risk to take. You can all do it however you want to do it. On my form then, for item, we'll enter toaster. 
serial number is not applicable as there isn't one. It's class one, fuses five amp, visual inspection is a pass, earth impedance was 0.05 ohms, insulation resistance is greater than 200 mega ohms, and polarity is a pass as I visually identified brown and blue are in the correct terminals in the plug top. That's the minimum amount of information I need for this particular item and I'm now going to write out a sticker with today's date. That's the date of inspection of course. The uh, recommended retest date, which I'm going to put two years from now. So let's go 150921. More on that later. This sticker has a, a number and this is a unique number which allows me to identify this particular item of equipment with this test on this date. This sticker number is never going to appear again on any other PAP test I do, which makes it uniquely identifiable. I'm going to place that on the plug top because that's the most obvious place for it to be. And they're quite robust, these stickers. They don't, they don't just drop off fairly, fairly easily. So let's pop that number onto the form then. And because I have a unique number, identifying this particular test to this item of equipment, I sometimes uh, save a bit of time by not bothering with the serial number field. But what about the watt and amp fields? Well, I know this is a 0.8 kilowatt appliance, so let's switch it fully on and run a simulated load test. If this toaster presents a 0.8 kilowatt resistive load, then by dividing power over voltage, it should draw about 3.5 amps. Does it? Let's ask the tester. And note that I'm gonna have to hold down the plunger here while performing this test as the heating elements are otherwise not connected. So if I press the load button, boom, there it is. 820 watts, 3.6 amps. Uh, obviously, the simulated load test can only be performed on certain appliances, generally those with resistive heating elements and no clever electronics, so toasters, radiators, kettles and such like. This means that the watt and amp fields are often filled out as not applicable on most tests. There's one other thing that needs to be verified, and that's the functional test. I plug it in and make sure it actually works as expected. Yep. Yeah. That's heating up. Exciting stuff, eh? Who among you doesn't have a spring on at this point? I know I do. My tester also supports automated testing, so if I reconnect my probe, hopefully with the same sort of connection as earlier, instead of having to rattle through the earth and insulation resistance test separately, if I connect the appliance like this, I can push the class one button and it will go through them autonomously to speed things up. Annoyingly, a quirk of this particular tester is that it will perform one additional test when in autonomous mode. That is the fuse test, which as we can see, has failed. So what's that all about? Well, a fuse test simply confirms that the instrument can detect a resistive load on the end of the flex here. So if it can see that there's a resistive load there, then the fuse in the plug must therefore be good. For the fuse test to pass, the power switch on the appliance must be in the on position and the appliance must present itself as a resistive load. And as I mentioned a moment ago, this toaster is off unless the plunger is pulled down. With no power, it won't latch down and has to be held down. If I leave it up, then we can see that the fuse test fails because uh, the heating elements aren't connected, the pad tester can't detect anything. Uh, so if I repeat that now, with that plunger held down, the fuse test passes and it moves on to the next test automatically, which is the earth test. Got 0.05 before, it's 0.08 now. Obviously I haven't got quite the same robust connection onto there as I perhaps had earlier. And we've passed insulation resistance at over 200 mega ohms. Jolly good. So you can see it, it goes through the sequence of tests automatically and speeds things up a bit. On something like a laptop power supply or a desktop computer, you won't have a physical mechanical switch, so the fuse test will naturally fail every time and will need to be skipped in order to proceed. Annoyingly, you can't turn it off or skip it by default. This is just a quirk of my particular tester, which means that on most tests, I get a fat false fail first up that I need to manually tell the tester to get stuffed. Personally, I could do without it, but there you go. Enough waffle about class one, let's move on to class two or double insulated, an electrical appliance that lacks an earth and can be identified by a double square symbol. Although there's no legal requirement for that to actually be displayed. Such an appliance has no exposed conductive parts. We have basic and supplementary insulation to keep your fingers or any other digits away from the live stuff lurking within. This particular hairdryer is a class two appliance. It has a two core flex with no earth wire and the case parts where the cable enters and terminates is made of an insulating material. Although the product 
has a standard plug top, a lot of class two equipment can be identified by their having a plastic earth pin uh, on their plug, which is just there to push open the socket shutters and to prevent the plug top from being inserted upside down. Between the plastic case and the live parts is an air gap air being an insulator at the kind of voltage we're talking about here. But watch my video on insulation resistance and 10 kilovolts if you want to see more about the resistivity of air. Even though there are metallic parts to this thing, the construction of it is such that there are always two layers of insulation between those metallic parts and anything live. One of those insulating layers being air in this case, the other being the plastic that the metal part is mounted onto. So for the purposes of pat testing, we start as usual with the visual inspection. Are there any cracks or breaks in the outer casing or flex? Is there any basic insulation, i.e. the brown and blue cores in the wiring exposed anywhere? All looks okay to me. Is the plug top uh, intact and to modern standards? Yes, yes. Let's peer in here. And we can see the brown and blue cores are cor correctly located. So our polarity is good. Everything's nice and tight. What do we have here? A 13 amp fuse to BS1362. All looks genuine, no sign of overheating. The cord grip is in place. Doesn't look like it's broken down around the cord grip. Clean bill of health there, I would say. So the rating plate on this thing says that it's uh, 1750 to 2100 watts. So, you know, we're talking sort of eight, nine amps, something like that. Therefore, this 13 amp fuse is appropriate. Let's get on to the testing then. I've got the hairdryer mechanically switched on, so when my Martindale does the fuse test, as it will in autonomous mode, uh, it should detect the resistive load in this thing and pass it, assuming the fuse is okay, of course. Because I'm selecting the class two option, the Martindale won't bother with the earth test, so all we're checking with the tester is insulation resistance. I'm zapping 500 volts up line and neutral together, and I want to detect what comes back down the probe. So using my screwdriver, my pokey stick here, I should ensure the probe is in contact with the metalwork on this thing, which is this metallic grill at the back here. Obviously, I expect it to pass. Something would have to be very cocked up in here for, the, for that bit of metalwork to be live. And before you ask, no, it's not checking the insulation between line and neutral going down the flex. All it's looking at is what is coming back down this probe. Uh, unlike class one, which has a uh, minimum value permitted at one mega ohm, class two has a pass point of two mega ohm. Let's light up this son of a bitch and see what we get, shall we? Last two. Off it goes with the fuse test. It passes that because it can detect the heating elements and motor inside there and insulation over 200 mega ohms. There we have it, a surprise factor of precisely zero. Uh, off scale high, uh, again, I, I may need to test different areas of this appliance to ensure it really is okay. And I should also perform the simulated load tests and the functional tests on this thing. But this video is already dragging on and you've seen how they work. So let's presume they pass and we'll sticker this the sucker up. Let's plumb in the data then. We know it's a hair dryer, and we do have a serial number to record this time. It's a class two item with a 13 amp fuse. Uh, visual inspections are pass. Earth is not applicable. IR was over 200 mega ohm. Polarities are passed because I verified that in the plug top. And for the uh, simulated load, I recorded 7.8 amps at 1800 watts. And we're gonna give it the unique number 4653 for this particular test. Let's move on to a simpler class two item such as this charger. With its plastic earth prong, there's no fuse to inspect and this can't be opened up. So the visual inspection is still valid and this looks fine of course, but the only test I can perform with my Martindale is purely insulation resistance. So if I click my probe to the uh, only bit of metalwork I've got access to here, which is on the output side of the thing, I expect a full pass. It would have to be pretty fucked over in here for the, uh, the probe to pick up the test voltage being squirted in. Uh, let's just run that. So that's a class two insulation test. And there we have it, no surprises there, off scale over 200 mega ohms. Uh, if there was no metal work whatsoever for me to click the probe to, then visual inspection is about as much as you can do, which is fine, as long as you show that on the paperwork. Let's plumb that one in then, I'm going to call it a charger. Uh, there's no serial number for me to worry about, it's a class 2 item, there's no fuse, visual inspection to pass, there's no earth, we're over 200 mega ohm on insulation, Polarity is a limitation, I can't verify it because I can't open it up. The simulated loads are not applicable and this is now appliance 4654. 
As someone undertaking pack tests, you also need to be able to recognise when a seemingly insulated appliance is actually class one. Desk and floor fans are usually a good example of all insulated con plastic constructions that are nonetheless earth. Take this example here. I know it's class one because the flex is labelled as having three cores. And if I open up the plug top, I can see that sure enough, there is an earth wire in there. But it's an all insulated construction. And if there are any metallic screw heads on show here, they're just biting into plastic. So there are no exposed conductive parts outside on this case in here that uh, someone could come into daily contact with. I, I suppose if they had a metal knitting needle and shoved it through into the louvers there, then they might come into contact with something that would get their hair standing on end, but uh, general idiocy is outside of the remit of the PAT process. We just want to know whether it is safe under normal operation, not what happens if it's misused, mistreated or damaged later on. Is this fan safe for continued normal operation right now at this time? That's the question I'm here to answer. So how can I answer that if I'm not able to test the earthing on the damn thing? Well, if the manufacturer has made the appliance so that the earth parts are not accessible without disassembly, then I'm snookered from a pat testing point of view. All I can do is put a limitation in the earth fault impedance column on the form and in the comments state that there's no accessible earth test point. So does that mean it fails the pat procedure? No, because it's a moot point for the most part. The shock protection of this appliance by design isn't being provided by the earthing. It's being provided by the insulated case. But don't get it confused with class 2 or double insulated. This fan doesn't meet the requirements for double insulation, as it has earthed parts in here. We just have to acknowledge it's a class 1 appliance with no access to the earth parts without disassembly or over-invasive poking. Of course, if there are no metal parts to connect our probe to, then we may also have to note the IR test as a limitation, leaving us with just a visual inspection. This fan does have an unearthed metallic bolt on the underside, so I can confirm it passes IR in this case. And you know, I've also seen some appliances in my time where there is a specific pat test point, a screw head presented on the outside of the equipment casing that is connected to the earth metal work within and specifically labeled so that the appliance can be tested. But that's not the deal here. I've talked about class one and class two equipment in this video, but what about class zero and class three? I don't hear you cry, as you may never have even heard of such. Well, class zero isn't something you're likely to come across as it's an item of equipment that relies on basic insulation only. An example given in the code of practice are the old Christmas tree light strings you used to get where you had 20 12 volt or 46 volt lamps connected in series by little more than bell wire, operating at 240 volts and with just a single layer of insulation between you and jolly festive ball ball tingling death. Such things are no longer manufactured and wouldn't comply with today's standards here in the UK. If we take a closer look at some Class Zero Christmas lights, these examples dating from the 1980s, you can see the conductor through the single layer of plastic. Not to be confused with this more modern set from the late 1990s, which are marked as being double insulated. So there are two layers of insulation apparently around the conductor here, and indeed I can't see the conductor on the show anywhere, so uh, hopefully that's well covered. Although it is still a thin wire and stringing 230 volts around your Christmas tree was never a very good idea. Although this more modern lighting set would pass a modern PAT inspection, assuming there's no damage of course, you are nonetheless still better off replacing them for a modern LED set where the dangerous voltages remain contained within the wall adapter for a much reduced fire and shock risk. Class 3 equipment is SELV, which in BS7671 is defined as separated extra low voltage, although in appliance standards SELV stands for safety extra low voltage. A class 3 appliance would be under 50 volts AC and electrically separated from earth. In all the pack tests I've ever performed, I don't recall ever coming across a class 3 item, so I won't spend time on them here today. We've also only been looking here at items that have a BS1363 plug top, but some equipment you may be asked to test may have something more industrial hanging off the end of its cord. For that reason I made these adapters a few years ago. The earth pin on the plug top connects to the earth pin of the socket and the line and neutral pins are all tied together. This allows us to perform the usual earth test, but when it comes to insulation resistance, we can apply the test voltage to all line and neutral parts simultaneously and see what leaks back to earth. Obviously, the danger stickers on these things are because they will go with a bang if this is plugged into a live outlet. Do not connect a main supply for pat test use only. Quite right. If in testing industrial equipment or 110 volt side equipment is going to regularly be your bag, then you're better off getting a more robust tester that has this kind of connectivity built in and has more than the basic range of test options. 
Moving deftly on, I've mentioned legality and that pat testing is itself not a legal requirement, so websites like this one are interesting. Excuse, if you will, the use of Magenta members to obscure the identity of this agency site, and the only reason I bring these fellows up is because they've been spamming me via email looking for contractors in this area to undertake pat testing and condition reporting, probably for pennies, and with my bill payment being a total pain in the nostrils if they're anything like the agencies I've dealt with in the past. So thanks, but no thanks. But look at this section. From December 2015, it became a legal requirement to carry out pat testing every five years in rented properties. Until now, pat testing has only been a best practice. They go on to say, although the new legislation only legally requires pat testing to be carried out every five years, it has long been best practice to have this carried out annually. New legislation? What's going on here then? Well, this company is based in Scotland, and under Scottish law there is indeed a statutory duty of care required of landlords, both for the fixed wiring and the fixtures and fittings. An EICR and PAT report is required at least every five years north of the border. This agency website talks of national coverage, but fails to mention that in England and Wales, we currently sadly lag behind when it comes to landlord duty of care, as we currently lack legislation for mandatory checks on rented properties. So, when I talk about legality, I do so from my own perspective here in deepest England, and this is reinforced by the Health and Safety Executive's website, where there's this rather handy fact. I've been told that, by law, I must have my portable electrical appliances tested every year. Is this correct? The answer refers to compliance with EAWR, but that there is nothing in EAWR to specify the process or frequency of PAT testing, nor is it a legal requirement to have it done at all, let alone every year. Regarding the frequency of testing, no fixed timescales are given, but the HSE and the Code of Practice state that the frequency depends on the environment the equipment is being used in. A power tool on a building site is at a greater risk of wear and tear than a computer sitting on an office desk. So if you're the person responsible for safety, maybe you decide to test the power tool every three months and the computer every two years. And this is where we find an interesting change in the fourth edition. Previously in the third edition, there was no mention of duty holders. Well, there was, but it wasn't given much prominence. The term duty holder isn't even in the index of this thing, unlike in the fourth edition, which is much clearer on the definition of who the duty holders are and their responsibilities. Take section seven, for example. In the third edition, we're straight into the nuts and bolts of inspection and testing. But the fourth edition instead starts off with risk assessments. And it says, any risk-based assessments are the responsibility of the duty holder, e.g. facility manager, building manager, landlord, etc. A duty holder may enlist the services of a competent person to assist in this process. This makes a big change for the frequency of testing, and we saw earlier how I applied a recommended retest date onto the pass label I affixed to my toaster, but it's up to the person in charge of site safety to ultimately decide upon the frequency of testing, as they're the duty holder. It's not for the PAT test person or anyone else to determine retest dates, although they can provide advice to the duty holder, of course. If you're a facilities manager, a landlord, or a business owner, you know what kit you've got, what exposure it has, who is using it, the requirements of your insurance, and the risk assessments you have applied. If you want to test items annually, fine, knock yourself out. If you want to undertake PAT testing every five years, you go right ahead. If you don't want to do it at all, that's okay. The point is, it's your risk to manage as you see fit, and your arse in the dock under EAWR if things turn to shit. It's telling that one change between the third and fourth editions of the Code of Practice is that in the fourth edition, the sample pass label does not have a recommended retest date, unlike in previous editions. Most PAT test labels, including all the ones I've ever bought, have had a recommended retest date that I filled out, but it's not actually for me to decide. So that is one thing I have been doing wrong all these years. Took me by surprise that, but it makes sense. I'm not the duty holder. It's not my risk assessment to make. And indeed, my new PAT test labels, fresh off the press, ready to start going out there, do not have a retest date upon them. So uh, from now on, I won't be putting retest dates on my labels. The retest date has also been open to abuse with many companies recommending annual tests, but that can be overkill and an unnecessary expense to end user organisations. An office computer sat on a desk probably isn't subject to the kind of wear and tear that can lead to a degradation of electrical safety. It's not being moved or hammered around, so do we really need to pay someone to come and check it every 12 months? Think about the electrical items in your home that never get checked at all. Your own computer, the TV on your wall, the lamp on your desk, the microwave oven in your kitchen. Do they go through wear and tear of the casing, earthing and insulation year on year in normal use? Of course not. And your average office environment isn't likely to be any more dangerous to such electrical items. So why have them formally checked that regularly? 
Speaking of microwave ovens, another change in the fourth code of practice is to drop all reference to microwave leakage. I'm not talking about earth leakage, but the leakage of microwave radiation from the oven when it's in use. That requires additional specialist equipment in the form of a leakage detector, such as I have here, and I always thought that it was a bit out of place. After all, the PAT process is about electrical safety, and although there is an element of functional testing, it's not really my place to be determining if any given appliance is operating entirely within specification. If I were testing an electric air compressor, for example, I would perform a functional test to ensure it blows out air when switched on, but I wouldn't be expected to check that the air pressure matches what's on the gauge. It's the same with microwave ovens. So long as it appears that it can switch on and operate, what do I care if microwave energy is leaking from the thing and silently sterilising the bollocks of Clive from marketing who's waiting for his jacket potato to cook in the office kitchen? I'm only concerned with the electrical safety of the thing. I'm not in a position to know about the ins and outs of radiation leaks. It's not something covered on the 2377 course, at least not that I can remember. The third edition mentioned microwave leakage should be checked at appropriate intervals, whatever the hell that meant, but the fourth edition scraps mention of microwaves completely, and quite right too, it's outside the scope of electrical testing. Otherwise, where do you draw the line? What other appliances could start creeping into the scope of PAT inspections for additional functional testing to ensure they're operating within calibration or specification? What other items of test equipment may be required for the inspector to arm themselves with outside of a portable appliance test instrument to tick off the non-electrical safety side of equipment? It's a nonsense, and it quite rightly got booted out. You also have to bear in mind the wider limitations of pack testing. Take a washing machine, for example. It has a motor and a heating element, but when I connect it to the pack tester, the electronic brain in this thing hasn't told either of those two components to switch on, and because the electrical testing is performed dead, there's no way to force those component parts to be connected, unlike on the toaster earlier, where I could hold down the plunger to connect the elements. This means when I pack test the washing machine, I'm doing so up to the control board and probably not beyond it. If there is a fault with the motor, or heater, depending on the nature of that fault, there's a good chance I'm not going to pick it up when cold and dead. As for the functional test, well again, as a pack tester, is it realistic that after testing I will plug in this appliance and run a full wash cycle to ensure that there are no issues? No, I'll switch it on, verify the display lights up, and that's about as much as I can do. It's the same with dryers, dishwashers, and other complicated equipment, which can only really be stress tested under conditions too complicated and time consuming to be practicable. For some appliances, pat testing is very limited in what it can tell us, but we can at least verify that when dead, the equipment is in a condition that makes it safe as far as is reasonably practicable to go live without killing someone at that time. And regardless of any recommended retest date or risk assessed frequency of testing, a PAT test, like a car MOT, only really proves safety at that moment in time. If a tested item is dropped down the stairs five minutes later, or if someone spills their beer over it, then of course you wouldn't say, well, it's okay, it's just been signed off as safe for the next two years. It's up to everyone to be responsible for the electrical safety of themselves and of others by recognising when something is broken or not functioning correctly, and to ensure that item is taken out of service. I'm going to demonstrate one more test with the Martindale today and that's the lead test and I have here an IEC lead or a kettle plug lead. This one's quite interesting because it has a right angle connector it also has a choke on it. Not sure why or where that came from. It has Panasonic written on it. I used to have a Panasonic word processor. I wonder if it came with that. I bet it did. Uh, so this is uh, this must date, uh, I was going to say, this dates to the, uh, the 90s in that case and that's confirmed by the fact that there's a pat test sticker on here with my initials on it, saying I last pat tested it on the 24th of March 1997. So there you go, 23 years since that was last run through a pat tester. I've already verified that visually it looks okay. Um, it's a moulded plug so I can't get in to check the clarity of the wiring, but I can check what fuse we've got here and it's a 5 amp. The Martindale will check the polarity for me on a lead test, so that's okay. Let's plug that into there and we'll plug this end into the IEC port on the Martindale and we'll select a lead test. Give it a bit of flexi flexi while it uh, checks the earth just to expose any um, poor connections on the earthing there, but uh, on the CPC. We've got a reading of 0 0.04 ohms for the earth, we've got over 200 megaohms for the insulation and the polarity is a pass, so this has verified that our line and neutral are indeed presented correctly, which is obviously what we want because we don't want the, um, 
the, the fuse to end up on the neutral side or anything like that. So this lid checks out just fine. I can enter the data on my form, assign it a unique test ID number. Had it been a clover lead I was testing, one of these which has the, uh, one of these C5 leads which has the different end to it, then I would need an IC to clover adapter. So that would plug into there and allow me to mate it with my Martindale to undertake exactly the same test. If I've got an appliance such as this vacuum cleaner here, which has a molded plug on it, which prevents me from opening the plug top to visually confirm the polarity of the wiring in the flex, then uh, when I'm filling out my PAT test form, I would have to mark the polarity column as a limitation. Again, this is a non-invasive process. I'm not gonna get busy with the screwdrivers and start pulling this thing apart. It should be safe for me to presume that the manufacturer assembled it correctly and passed it through quality control. It's the same with brand new equipment. If an appliance is under 12 months old and hasn't been obviously mistreated, you can choose to omit it from the PAT process as the expectation ought to be that it was made to standard and quality checked. We shouldn't have to second guess brand name items that are still in warranty. A new section of the fourth code of practice confirms this and goes on to say that new equipment should be recorded on the equipment register and a determination should be made on the frequency of testing for it going forward. So what about second-hand or hired equipment? In the case of used goods being sold for commercial gain, they should be fit for purpose and safe to use. So charity shops, for example, can take in and sell second-hand electrical goods so long as they've been subjected to this process and they pass. Hired equipment is interesting as the code of practice says you are responsible for the equipment you hire. An office with hired water coolers, vending machines and photocopiers will be responsible for their inspection and testing unless there is an agreement that the hire company will specifically undertake this task themselves. Still on the lead test then, and I'm gonna test this six-way extension strip. It passes the visual inspection, so we'll skip that on camera. It's a six-way affair, so I ought to check each outlet, but here today I'm just gonna check the end one, the one that's furthest away from the cord. And I'm gonna use this very short IEC lead that comes with my pat tester. This is short to keep its resistance down. I want to know the resistance of the earth path for this item, not the resistance introduced by my own test equipment. If you don't have a short lead, you can use a longer one, measure its resistance, and deduct it from the tests as you undertake them. So let's plug this into that end. And then we'll plug the extension strips, plug into our socket on the tester. So we have this nice loop going on and we are going to kick off a lead test. Okay, earth path is acceptable at 0 0.05 ohms. What's this on insulation? 1.71 mega ohm. You notice it's past it. Uh, it's past polarity as well, so the overall thing is a pass, but 1.71, that's an awfully low number, isn't it? What on earth's going on there? Class 1 item, so uh, we would expect a lower limit of 1 mega ohm, so it's, it's only just sort of scraped through. But, what's this? It says on here, surge. Ah ha ha ha. Okay, well there's our smoking gun then. What's happening here is my tester is spunking 500 volts up line and neutral, and that over voltage is getting squashed by the varista inside here. We can see in the corner of the display here, I don't know how well you can see that, that it got to uh, 429 volts, and then the uh, the varista broke down and shorted it out and that, that was the end of that. What I need to do then in order to get a true reading of the insulation out of this thing and to, instead of a reading that's being skewed by the varista is go into the insulation resistance menu and switch it from 500 volts to 250 volts. And now we shall repeat the lead test again. We still expect to get the same sort of number on the earth. Nothing's changed there. No, I, I haven't been flexing the, the cable on this one. I should have done that, but uh, I'm too busy yapping away. 0 0.05 still, insulation 196. So we're, we're not off scale high, um, but we're, we're not far off. It's certainly a much better reading than it was before. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plumb that data into our PAT result sheet. So this is a six way extension strip for want of a better term. There's no serial number I need to worry about. It's class one. It's 13 amp, visual inspection was a pass, earth continuity 0.05, insulation resistance 196 mega ohm, polarity came out as a pass, and of course there's nothing to record for the amp and watt field. So this is 4656, a unique number, and I'm gonna make a note in the comments that it's an SPD tested at 250 volts. My short IEC lead can also be used to connect to IT equipment and power supplies that lack their own power cords to enable me to undertake testing on those appliances. On a typical desktop PC setup, you're probably going to have two IEC leads, one for the monitor, one for the computer that are each subject to their own 
uh, testing requirements and then you've got the monitor and the computer unit itself so they could potentially be four individual pack tests just for one desktop pc setup before we move on to my rogues gallery of things that have been passed improperly by others, let's have a quick look at a couple of other testers, starting with the Metrail MI3311, which is Nigel's pack tester from back in the day when he ran his own business. It's a nice bit of kit. Certainly a better physical display than my Martindale, although the way it presents information is arguably not so good, as we'll see. Let's perform a test on this IEC lead here. This is the short lead that Nige uses with this kit. And I'm going to go into uh, simple test and down to IEC. The first thing it does is it forces me to make a decision on the visual inspection. It's not applying a test here, merely asking me if the casing, fuse and wiring are in a pass and fail condition before it starts. If I select fail, then it will abort further testing and allow me to record this appliance in its memory as having failed the process. I'll select pass for this one and now the earth continuity test shows up. We can see it will put out 200 milliamps for a limit of 5 seconds. And Nige has the upper limit set to uh, 0.2 ohms here, which is higher than the 0.1 ohm pass rate that the code of practice lists. And that's just so that longer extension leads don't get flagged as a false fail unnecessarily. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Off it goes and we get a pass, 0.03 ohms, jolly good. If we go to next, we can see the insulation resistance test is set at 500 volts for two seconds with a one mega ohm pass rate. Off scale is what we want and at over 200 mega ohms, off scale is what we get. Finally, we have polarity. And that too will hopefully check out in this case, and indeed it does. It's a nice tester, but I'd rather it gave you a summary of all the results at the end. Instead, you have to switch the thing to the view results option to remind yourself of the numbers. In order to cut down on some of the button stabbing, we can go into the menu and into speed test setup and set that to fast. Now if I repeat that test, that lead test, you can see now that it runs through the whole bally lot without any input from me. That does mean you can't change settings such as pass limits or insulation resistance voltage on the fly, but if you're on site faced with a pile of leads where the parameters don't need to be changed, then it makes for a quicker operation. Although again, there's no summary of results without my scrolling to the view option, which is annoying if you're recording the results separately as I do. The simple test menu allows you to select and fire through a pre-configured test setup, which is great. But you do also have the single test option should you just want to perform any one of the basic tests. If we go into the shortcut menu, then there are lots of predefined tests we can scroll through to ensure the tester is ideally set up for the environment we're in. For most offices, the IT equipment setting is perhaps the most pertinent, but there are other predefined test setups here that can be chosen. This model can store up to 1500 results, it has help screens, and the tests are customizable to allow it to better adapt to future changes to the code of practice. I don't think it supports load tests like mine though. There is a menu for functional testing, But that's more a pass fail as judged by the person undertaking the tests rather than a simulated load like my Martindale performs. Anyway, I won't dwell on it more here. I just wanted to show you an example of an alternative handheld instrument. Now let's take a look at something with bigger balls. And this is the Metrel MI2141. At eight and a half kilos and with no battery, this isn't the handheld type of tester we've already been looking at. So being mains powered, we can actually perform some hard tests with this beast. My thanks to my mucker Carl at KRS Developments, who sold me this unit second hand after having no interest in the pat test market himself. And also to 3Q Industrial Supplies Limited for quickly calibrating it for me. There's a link in the description to their site. And if you're after speedy calibration services, then look no further. I especially like the personal touch they went to by returning it to me with some custom-made Nige is a whoosh stickers. He sure is. 
Looking at the tester, you'll recognise the menu type when we use it as it's very similar to Nigel's Metrol, perhaps unsurprisingly. It also has the 115 volt test socket, of course, and it can store results and zap them over to PC via an RS232 serial port, which hints as to the age of this thing as it would all be USB these days, of course. This apparatus has a barcode scanner and a quick reference card, allowing me to select the type of test that I want. In this case, I'm going to do another lead test. We'll use the same IEC lead as we did earlier, this old girl. So we plug that into there and there, and I'm going to press start to run the test. Let's zoom in on that screen, shall we? And the first thing we can see is that, again, I have to manually confirm that the item under test passes visual inspection. We can see we've got appliance case, appliance fuse and appliance mains cable, all those options here, and I can pass or fail individual items or the whole bally lot in one go. Right, it's next going to perform the earth bond test on this cable, but unlike the previous two testers which were limited to 200 milliamps of test current, I'm going to run this at a smoking 25 amps, thanks to a beefy step down transformer inside here which takes up much of the bulk and weight of this thing to deliver a low voltage at a higher amperage. So let's press start. I'm going to wiggle the cable. Let's wiggle while we work. As I said, this is the same cable we saw earlier and it passes the earth bond test with much the same result. Insulation and polarity tests occur automatically next as it's set up for the quick test function to limit my button pressing. And again, at the end, there's no view summary without my selecting it. Uh, I should say that we can save the results locally if I so wish, and if the appliance has a barcoded serial number, then I can use that same barcode reader to zap it into the memory of this thing to save having to type it out. But let's press view and we can see a summary of the results for this test. The earth bond cable accompanying this instrument is a three pin affair rather than a single wire like on the other testers and my understanding of that is that the additional pins are used to automatically measure and null out the lead resistance for more accurate reporting. Obviously if performing the hard test for earth bonding as we just did on that lead you need to be wary of what you're pumping all that current into. I've got a bit of 2.5mm copper here and I've connected it to my TIS E217 with its backlit sexy time display that we've seen previously on other videos. And this time it's got the temperature probe connected to it which is currently reading a respectable room temperature of just under 24 Celsius. But I'm going to connect my probe to that bit of copper that's within the socket outlet there and what we'll do is we'll do the hard test, the 25 amp hard test and we'll see how that heats things up shall we. Single test, earth bond, we'll whack that up to 25 amps and off we go. There. And in five seconds it went up to over 48 degrees Celsius. That's quite a rise in a short space of time. That. Now I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll repeat that test with a thinner bit of copper wire, this being a strand out of a multi-strand cable, so thinner even than one millimetre. Once again we're going to repeat the same test, this time with the thinner copper. Again we're at room temperature, 24 and a half Celsius. And off we go. Wowzers. <laughs> There's actually smoke coming off that. <laughs> that got to over 200 Celsius, that did, so it just goes to show you've got to be a bit uh, a bit wary of the high current hard test. Uh, you can't just go pumping 25 amps into just anything. Um, you might actually end up doing some rather nasty damage. We saw how the Martindale tester earlier performed a fuse check by looking for a resistive load being connected before testing started, and this model does the same. If I start certain tests, it comes up with this warning of a line to neutral resistance being too high where it can't detect a straight resistive load, and it asks for the fuse and power switch to be checked to ensure they're good and switched on before it proceeds. This tester also has a leakage test option, which is a test referred to by the Code of Practice as a protective conductor stroke touch current measurement test. 
Some battery testers like Nigel's have a substitute leakage option, which is a cut down version of the same test, although neither the leakage or substitute leakage tests form part of the required tests in the fourth edition of the Code of Practice. Some PAT instruments perform a substitute leakage test automatically, and it is a test that can be misleading and can flag up a false fail. So it's important to be aware of it and to beware of it. The purpose of a leakage test is to apply a supply voltage to the appliance to see if there is any current leaking to earth when it's powered on, or at least partially powered, as all testing up to this point has been done on the appliance when it's dead. But we know many appliances have filters or controllers which are dead ends to the test process. Therefore, if we apply a bit of juice into the thing, we can perhaps have a chance of getting further into it for some more robust probing. Obviously, a battery tester cannot fully power an appliance and will limit the supply voltage to perhaps just 40 volts AC, such as what Nigel's unit supplies, although my beast here can supply a full 230 volts. But we have to be wary that applying any voltage to something with a heating element or motor can cause it to operate partially, if not wholly, so we need to be careful. Let's apply leakage tests to this inspection lamp. We'll start with the substitute leakage, which will output 40 volts AC into this compact fluorescent lamp. Before I start the test, you can see this symbol flashing away here to inform me that I need to have the appliance switched on. When I start the test, you can see that the lamp isn't presenting itself as a resistive load to my metal, and the 40 volts isn't enough to actuate the ballast circuitry in the lamp, so the tester is asking me to double check the fuse and power switch before proceeding. We're all good to go here, so uh, let's say yes to that and let's go. Incidentally, the probe is not connected to the appliance for this test, so if any of the test current is leaking to earth, then it's through the earth pin of the uh, appliance or into something else that the appliance is in current contact with. So we've just fired 40 volts AC into it, and there's no loss of current here. Let's do the same at 230 volts AC for the full rather than the substitute leakage test. This time, I get three warnings before it starts. One tells me to ensure that the earth bond clip is not connected to the appliance under test. The next tells me to ensure that the appliance is switched on. And finally, I get a warning that 230 volts AC will be applied to the test socket. Again, when I tell it to start, the tester will put out a small voltage to try and detect if there's a load connected to the socket. And again, that voltage isn't high enough to actuate the circuitry of the lamp. So that's not going to play ball until it gets a larger wallop. So we'll tell it to proceed. And sure enough, the CFL now illuminates once the full 230 volt squirts out of the test socket. The current leakage is 0 milliamps, and the load being drawn is 0.04 kVA. So to convert that into watts, 0.04 times uh, a power factor, which is probably about 0.6 for a fluorescent lamp, uh, times 1000, would give us about 24 watts. Uh, this is apparently a 23 watt CFL lamp, so there you go. I don't know what the power factor of this lamp really is, but I guess that's about right. But uh, I'm going off topic here, suffice to say there's no current leaking from this inspection lamp. And as a class 2 item lying on a plastic coated bench, that's a surprise factor of fuck all I guess. So let's find something else that we can play with. On then to a class 1 iron. There's not going to be any nonsense here where it can't detect the connected load and being resistive the power factor should be nearer zero which means even I should be able to do the maths without a calculator. Let's start with the substitute leakage test and this time we're getting a reading of 0.01 milliamps leaking into the earth bin of this thing. I can live with that. Let's do the full shebang then. Leakage test at 230 volts. And again, this time there's not going to be any warning about no load being detected here. Uh, you can see the neon indicator of the thing has illuminated. And the leakage current remains the same at 0.01 milliamps. The power consumption is 2.28 kVA. And if we assume this is purely resistive, then that would be about 2.2, 2.3 2 kilowatts. And Sure enough, that matches the rating of this thing, so uh, that's hopefully about right. Um, that is quite warm, by the way, even though it was only powered for five seconds. The leakage test then has its place, but we need to be aware of what the pass and fail limits are, as it isn't a one-size-fits-all test. 
So whatever the limit has been set to on the tester can cause false fails. Table 15.3 gives portable or handheld class 1 equipment a pass limit of 0.75 milliamps. Although this tester currently has a limit of 0.25 milliamps set here, but for something like a washing machine, 3.5 milliamps would be the limit, while a heating appliance could be up to 5 milliamps, depending on its rating. For this reason, I don't favour the cheap testers that perform leakage testing automatically, because someone who has a cheap tester is also likely to be someone who doesn't know how to interpret the test results being obtained, or to set the appropriate limit to suit the test, which means appliances get failed unnecessarily. One last test to demonstrate, and once more this isn't one the code of practice requires, and that's the touch leakage current test. Again, not one you'd find on a battery tester, as it operates at 230 volts, this time with the earth bond probe connected to the appliance. This test applies a 2 kilo ohm resistance to simulate a human body in contact with the appliance to see what current would flow across it. Let's try it out. It's going to run for 10 seconds. You can see the iron is on, and it seems there's nothing across our 2K of simulated human body resistance, so I guess this iron isn't going to kill the wife anytime soon. And yes, she does do all the ironing. But to be fair, none of the scruffs I wear ever get ironed, so don't have too much of a pop at me for traditional sexist roles within my household. One thing I can't demonstrate here is a flash test, as none of the testers I have to hand support it. I'd need the next model up for that, the Amiga Pat. Again, you'll only find a flash test on a mains powered machine, and you'd only perform it, if at all, after all other tests have passed. To be honest, as someone who generally tests offices and items for charity shops or in my local repair cafe, I've never needed to undertake a flash test. The purpose of a flash test is again to test the effectiveness of the insulation, this time by whacking 1.5 kilovolts up line and neutral of a class 1 appliance to see what leaks back through the earth bin, or 3 kilovolts AC up a class 2 to see what leaks back through the flash probe touching exposed casing parts. Obviously that's a robust kind of test, and not one you'd apply to your average PC or phone charger. If flash testing is something you need to be doing, then you already ought to know more about the PAT test process than I do, so there's no need to be watching this video. And now finally, the bit you've probably really been waiting for, let's take a sneak peek at when it all goes wrong. What happens when you hire a cheap sticker slapper, a budget bozo, a Pat Pratt who has never done the course, read the code of practice, or even flicked through the manual that accompanied his likely uncalibrated instrument as he undertakes your Pat testing, probably without any professional indemnity insurance? What I have here are products previously passed by prior Pratt pricks, perhaps unprofessionally prepared for the pissing Pat process performed. Enter Exhibit A. As already mentioned, British Standard 1363 was updated way back in 1984 to include sleeving on the line and neutral pins of a plug top to prevent accidental contact with live parts when inserting or removing it into a socket. So if you come across one of these older plug tops, then it should be replaced with a modern version, such as this Click Skullmore example. Yet, here we see a sticker applied to this plug top in 2013 by someone who failed to recognise what he was looking at. Not only that, but there are at least two other stickers under here with the same name on them, which meant this got passed year after year. I've obscured the name, but this is from a PAT test firm, not an electrician doing PAT on the side as I do, so you'd assume they'd know their shit. It's literally their job. And OK, you might think I'm being a bit out of order here, as the code of practice is not retrospective, and it does state that where such plug tops are still in their original use, that they may remain. But come on, the standard was changed 36 years ago, and for good reason. And although you may not fail an appliance with such a plug top on it, personally, I'll change it for a new one and levy a small charge for the effort. Here's another example. This adapter is made to convert a shaver plug to a BS1363 socket outlet, and it has a December 2017 pass date on it. Again, the telephone number Googles to a proper PAT test specialist firm, and has been obscured here to protect the guilty. And they are guilty, as there are all sorts of wrong here. Let's compare it to a valid unit. The pin dimensions on this thing are undersized. You can see they're not as long, and they're thinner than the requirements of BS1363. Uh, they're also unsleeved again, of course, and the plastic material around them is insufficient. It would be so easy to accidentally come into contact with the brass here as you inserted or removed this damnable thing. 
Also, it isn't fused, and neither will be the kind of plug you insert into it, so the overload protection is lacking for the end appliance. If you plug this into a 32 amp ring socket circuit, common here in the UK, then that 32 amp breaker is your overcurrent protection, whereas this legitimate unit has a 1 amp fuse fitted. Finally, and again, unlike the proper job, there are no protective shutters inside it. So when this thing sits in the socket outlet, a child can insert a metallic object into here with deadly results. It's staggering that someone passed this on a PAT test and no doubt charged the client for doing so. It fails to meet British standards and would be illegal to sell here. Presumably it got onto our shores, accompanying some kind of electrical cack that was bought abroad. If you're going to spooge one out over a shaver plug adapter, then this one should be your pornography of choice. If you're spilling your yakult over this thing instead, then frankly, you're a bit weird. Here's another one in my collection, passed in 2012. Another adapter which flies in the face of BS1363, and perhaps even worse than the one we were just looking at, as there is even less clearance between the plastics around and the live pins, although they are partially insulated and the unshuttered holes are even larger with the brass inside closer to the edge. As a fat adult, even I can get close to the dangerous bits in here with my finger. If this were left near a child, the consequences could be fatal. Again, it's not fused and it's not legal to sell this here. Chances are it came in with some moody foreign import. It does laughably have a CE stamp upon it, which is probably fake. It certainly doesn't have the British standard kite mark on it as seen on this legitimate Skullmore product although a lot of knockoffs these days also fake that symbol too. How about this cable? I've passed, it proudly proclaims, with a number and a smiley face upon it. Again, this is from a pat testing specialist outfit. The trouble is, this label has no date on it. Although the labels in the code of practice have dropped the next inspection date, they're still supposed to show the date the last test was carried out. We came across a load of these at an office years ago, and it seems the way they worked was to change the colour of the smiley face every year. So they could phone the facilities manager and say, any equipment with a yellow face on it was now out of date and needed to be retested with a blue face label instead. Or something. Crock of shit. It leaves everyone but them ignorant of when any given item of hardware was last checked. The website for these people now redirects to a major national maintenance firm, so they must have been bought out, but I don't know if this iffy practice still goes on with them. Here's another interesting example. This one has definitely been passed by a sticker slapper. I think someone's picked this up on the day, thought, oh, you know, I've tested so many IEC leads, I can't be asked to test anymore. I'm just going to stick labels on them and run away, because uh, had they had a closer look at this and had they run it through their PAT instrument, then they probably would have found what I'm about to show you today, that this is counterfeit. You can tell it's counterfeit because look at that, the earth pin is sleeved. If we look again at our click skull more example, yes, line and neutral pins ought to be sleeved, but not the earth pin, for goodness sake. If you see a sleeved earth pin, then that's a guarantee that you've got some dodgy product there, something that's uh, crawled out of some shitbox factory in China. It's interestingly, it's got a British standard kite mark on there, which is obviously fake. But if we put it in the pat tester, I keep saying pat tester, that's going to annoy people, isn't it? I should say pat instrument or whatever. And we're going to tell it to do a uh, 25 amp earth bond test, as we saw earlier. Look at that, no earth continuity. Zoom in a bit close to that screen over 19.99 ohms fail. So not only did this come out of some crappy Far East factory with the earth pin half sleeve, but it's not even connected inside. Uh, either it's a two core cable or it's just, just not actually connected up. Chances are that the uh, material, the conducting material inside the cable is also not what it claims to be. Let's see what it says. It says, it says it's a three core 0.75 mil I bet it's not. I bet if we open that up, we'd probably find that the cable was thinner than that. It may also not be copper. And this fuse, which it claims to be to British standard 1362, is probably also counterfeit. In fact, let's see if we can bust it open, shall we, and see what's inside. Well, there is a bit of wire inside. We're surrounded by ceramic. Uh, whether that's a legitimate 
13 amp fuse wire or what. I can't tell, can't risk it. It's going in the bin. So yeah, someone's passed that, but they should have been able to see at a glance that it's not legitimate because that's a dead giveaway. And had they run it through the tester, then that would have confirmed that it's not fit for purpose and ought to be destroyed. The last thing to say about those who don't know what they're doing is that you may end up paying for tests on equipment that never needed it. Here's one I came across on some fixed wiring I was decommissioning. Yes, that's a PAT test label on a fused isolator. I don't know, maybe they did an EICR and ran out of proper test and inspect labels, or maybe a PAT tester just got so slap happy that he went around whacking labels onto anything electrical. The last time I worked in an office, the facilities manager hired in a pat test outfit who did just this. I came in one morning and found pass stickers on PC docking stations that run off 15 volts DC and laptop computers at 18 volts DC. A pat person should test the mains cable, they should test the external power supply, those things each run at 230 volts, but testing extra low voltage DC kit on the end of that was a nonsense. This hardware wasn't any kind of electrical risk. I had a stand-up argument with the bloke who was doing the testing where I had to tell him to bloody well cut it out. I made the point that he may as well sticker up my mobile phone as it sat on charge on my desk. And you know what? The cheeky twat tried to stand his ground and even phoned his boss to report it. As he was charging per item though, I told him that we wouldn't be paying for anything that was outside of his remit. So we could go nuts with his stickers, but we weren't going to pick up the tab for any equipment not directly taking mains power. What does that say about his knowledge of the process though? Could we trust him to carry on? We started undertaking our own tests in-house after that. In this video, I've shown some formal class 1 and class 2 tests, which you might undertake every year or two in most environments, but you're supposed to be undertaking user checks more frequently. If you regularly dole out electrical equipment to the public in, say, a village hall, then you may visually inspect it beforehand each time or on a weekly basis or something. You don't necessarily have to formally record it unless you find a fault. But if you're a duty holder, then you can't just go by the sticker date. You still have to exercise a little noodle. Is pat testing fun? Is it a service you should add to your portfolio? Nige detests pat testing and we tend to take on few large pat test jobs. We did a large office when we first started business and it was a killer. All the desks had cable management for their wiring so every desk had to be stripped out, cables and equipment tested, then reassembled. We were there for about a week and it was back breaking to have to keep crawling around. It's not something I would choose to do day in day out and it's little wonder people start shortcutting it by whacking stickers on without too much thought. These days we might do a small office, 70 to 100 items or so, but we wouldn't be up for anything much more than that. The money can be alright though, you have to work out what charge per item you're going to apply to make the job worthwhile for yourself. Don't try and compete with the low end competition who just aren't doing the job properly. For my business I see it as a bit of a loss leader, but I find it's a good foot in the door. All my stickers have my name, website address and phone number on, so getting into an office and slapping that advertising on everything from computers to kettles is a no-brainer. And of course you can get chatting to any of the staff who happen to need electrical work. Some people also put a minimum quantity or call-out charge on pack testing, but I don't. There are a lot of little home businesses, people who have to take equipment to public places whose insurance demand it's been tested before it can be used. Examples are singers, bands and DJs who have electric instruments, amps, decks and lighting who need proof of electrical safety to play at small venues. Cooks who take their own equipment to kitchens. Cleaners who turn up to small offices with their own vacuums etc. They might only have three or four items, but if they're in my immediate area, then I pat test per item, no higher rate, no call out charge. It might be hardly worth my diesel, but who do you think they'll call or recommend to their friends as an electrician from now on? It's one of those quick and easy services you can provide cheaply that really boosts your local word of mouth reputation. Of course, there is the expense of the training and equipment, and yes, you do need to keep it calibrated, and you need professional indemnity insurance, so there are initial and annual overheads to consider. By undertaking this work, you're passing judgement on the electrical safety of the items you test. So if someone dies and you end up tits deep in hot piss under EAWR, you'll want to be able to prove you kept your own kit maintained, and you are qualified and insured for the work. Remember, under EAWR Regulation 29, you are required to get yourself off the hook by proving you took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence to have avoided whatever unfortunate incident has landed you in legal bother. 
Anyway, I'm going to bring this video to a close here as it's gone on for much longer than I intended. I thought a video on pack testing would be a rather quick and easy affair, but I've only really touched upon it today, despite it being months in the making. There is a lot more to it and a lot I've left out. I can't cover a two-day course and a fat code of practice in a brief video. And you know, I'm no teacher. Remember, I'm just a run-of-the-mill sparky trying to figure this shit out. So there may be things I've got wrong in this video. Don't take my word for it. Always do your own research on anything that is important to you and that your livelihood may depend upon. Remember too that the code of practice is about to be updated again, so some of what I've said here may fall out of date in edition 5, which is on the horizon for a release any time now. And here's me spending 43 quid on edition 4. Fuck it all. Where did my pornography go?